Hello, good morning students. Uh, we are back today to see how we can progress with our lecture. Uh, last time we looked at uh, the course outline uh, concerning what we shall cover in now in the course of our learning. So today we want to begin with the introductory part on statistics and, and from there we shall see the way forward. So, I will come here to this platform, endeavor to ask where you don't understand or where you need an assistance, you raise up your hand and you will be given chance to speak. So don't leave the lecture without understanding, so anything you need an elaboration on, don't hesitate please inquire so we shall begin right away with some statistical terms and concepts that we shall meet along the way in the process of our coverage the first term is uh, data <coughs> so we shall find data almost in most of the sub 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 topics that we shall do under statistics so uh Data is simply scientism term for figures, facts, and information. So you'll find that an example of data are incomes of families, max scored in an examination, number of goals scored by each football team, among other examples. So you find that it is uh, facts or figures that have not yet been processed into a more meaningful form. Uh, another <coughs> another term is attribute. So an attribute is non measurable. So it is a characteristic that an, an individual or an object can either possess or may not have. For example, an individual can be male or female. You can either be a male or a female. You can either be dark or light skinned among others so there's no measure of how a male or a female somebody is or there is and therefore sex and other non-measurable characteristics of an individual so attributes are features of an object or an individual that cannot be measured then another term is a variable A variable <coughs> so when we talk about a variable it is the opposite of an attribute now these are characteristics that can be measured and you find that they assume different values uh, an example of a, a variable can be heights or ages or weights of a person so for example you can determine <coughs> the height of an individual the age of an individual so all vary all vary there are two types of variables we have uh, discrete variables and then we have continuous variables i uh, will look at the discrete variables uh, these are variables that can take a finite <coughs> or countable number of values so discrete variables have got a, a whole number they have a whole number so meaning that they are complete numbers they do not have that element of this or maybe 5.2 if it is 5 then it is 5 so a discrete variable is one that can only take a finite or countable or whole number values within a given range for example if it is a goal you cannot score half a goal you either score a goal or you do not score a goal so goals scored by a football team is a good example of a finite number or of a discrete variable then you have continuous variables <coughs> so you find that this is now the opposite of a discrete variable so with these continuous variables they cannot take a finite number of values so uh, this is 
one whose values can theoretically take on an infinite number of values within a given range of values so it cannot emerge as a whole number there will be some always continuous values for example you can if you find that a boy has a height of 40.2 inches that is a continuous value so continuous variables are measured rather than being counted so for example the height of a child may be any of the infinite number of points between let's say 40 inches and 40.2 inches uh, proceed from there so we have what we call <coughs> a random variable a random variable so when we talk about a random variable it is a phenomenon of interest in which the outcomes of an activity are entirely by chance so you find that uh, you cannot predict the outcome of an activity so these are absolutely unpredictable and they may differ from response to response for example lottery drawings for example lottery drawings are considered to be random variables since each number has exactly the same chance of being picked up uh, let's say you're playing a ludo this game of chance you're casting a die the die has got uh, six faces whereby each face has an equal chance of appearing uppermost so when you cast a die once you cannot predict that maybe i'll make a six on top or i'll make a five on top or a one on top so everything happens just randomly uh without your knowledge or without your influence then uh, we have qualitative random variables so if i that basically talk about qualitative we mean variables that cannot be expressed into quantitative or in statistical form so uh these yield category categorical responses so that the responses fit into one category or another so they cannot be expressed in quantitative measures for example response to a question such as are you currently married so it's either yes or no we cannot quantify that so this fits in the category of either a yes or no then we do have uh, quantitative random variables so you find that quantitative random variables they yield numerical values or numerical variables for example responses to such questions how many children are there in your family of course they like they can be four well any other number but there will be a number for you to state to answer that question uh quantitative random variables can either be discrete random variables or continuous random variables so meaning they can either be uh whole numbers or they can be a finite number or an infin infinite number then we do have discrete quantitative random variables <coughs> So of course these discrete quantitative random variables they yield responses which are whole numbers or which are finite for example <clears throat> uh, number of people attending a workshop or number of mangoes in the basket so you find that you can get exactly this number of mangoes in the basket you can exactly get the number of people attending a workshop because you cannot have one and a half a person attending a workshop they together with 20 people or none of the people or zero people <clears throat> so well, then we have continuous quantitative random variables of course these are countables but in infinite they can be go beyond the whole number so these yield responses that are values which are measured but not counted for example heights of models in a beauty contest can be a continuous quantitative random variable because the height can be a recurring figure 4.2 4.99 and so on weights of people on a weight loss program so it may not be exactly a whole number someone may be 
45.3 kgs uh proceed we have what we call a population uh <clears throat> so when we talk about a population we simply mean the totality of things objects and persons under consideration uh, for example, if we are interested in knowing the percentage of adult Ugandan travelers who go to America annually, then all those adult Ugandans who travel abroad become our population. So uh, all those travelers become our population. So meaning a population is the totality of things, persons, or objects. Then we have a sample. Now, a sample is simply a portion of a what? Of a population because from a population we pick a sample. The sample is a portion of the total population that is considered for study and analysis. So we find that it is selected in such a way so as to be representative of the entire population. <clears throat> so for instance, if we want to study the income of a pattern of lecturers at Makere University and 500 and our 500 lecturers then we may take a random sample of only 50 lecturers out of the 500 for the purpose of the study so we find that the 50 we take out of 500 now 500 lecturers is a population of lecturers at Makere but when we choose 50 out of the 500 the 50 chosen becomes the sample the 50 chosen becomes the sample uh, <clears throat> or have sampling so sampling is a process a process of selecting is a given sample from a set of a population so uh, it is technical and economically not feasible to take the entire population so we we'll find that when carrying out research in especially when the population is large for purposes of producing on the costs of carrying out the research and then maybe time element if someone wants to save on the time of carrying out conducting out conducting the research then a sampling would be the best option to avoid over incurring costs as well as wasting time and some other thing factors as well so when you make a sample uh, it becomes simpler for the researcher to find or to come up with these findings so sampling is suitable when it comes to large populations uh, we have a random sample so when we talk about a random sample is where the members in a sample are chosen out randomly where you find that in a given sample in a given sample uh, members are chosen out randomly so meaning that when we consider population each and every member has got an equal chance of being chosen and placed into our sample from that population so it is a collection of items selected from a population in such a way that each item in the population has exactly the same chance of being selected as any other so that the sample taken from the population is truly representative of the population so you find that when you make a random sample it eliminates these elements of bias because sometimes if bias is included in selecting a sample then you may not be able to get results reflecting what you want due to that element of bias in the selection uh, <clears throat> for example if you want to take a random sample of 10 persons from a group of 30 persons then each of the 30 must have the same chance of being selected into the sample so a true random sample should be free from all biases whatsoever so that would give a reflective result a reliable result concerning the intention of the research then we have statistical data <coughs> so data collected for statistical purposes is of two types 
we do have primary data and then we have secondary data of course depending from the sources from which it was collected now when we talk about primary data you're going to find that primary data refers to that data that has been collected for the very first time then secondary data is that data that is being collected for the second time so meaning someone already may carried out research on the on the on, on the problem and then got some findings so uh if you come to conduct research you begin from what the other person did for example if you're given a coursework uh if you're given a coursework you're going to look into what people researched already and then find out your answers In most cases courseworks are done based on secondary data some information that someone already researched on and presented to the public concerned so we have primary data <coughs> Uh, these are data that are collected afresh and from the first time from the source. Primary data is collected for a specific purpose or study or inquiry. Uh, it always possesses an original character and it can either be surveyed data if it is obtained in uncontrolled situation by asking questions or it can be collected by experimentation that is if someone collects it, collects it through making experiments uh, then you have secondary data as we said Sec as we hear secondary so this is the data that has already been collected and also has passed through the statistical process so we find that uh, the, so the different sources of Second, secondary data can be newspapers, journals, magazines, reports, books, and so on. So advantages of secondary data. <coughs> so some of the advantages of secondary data is that one, it is reasonably cheap to obtain and to use and relatively faster than primary data so you find that when it comes to collecting data through collecting secondary data you find that you're not going to to incur much since data is already available so meaning that is going to be cheap both in time in terms of cost and time unlike when it comes to primary data that is being collected for the very first time so this data is also good some disadvantages so on in case of any areas in it such errors may be passed on to other users of the data so sometimes you may find that someone conducted research but uh, incomplete maybe there are some areas that were not captured in the research so if you come and still use this information then you may not realize such errors and you will pass on this as well to other users of the data then uh, uh, you may find that this another disadvantage uh, is that it may it may have been collected for a different purpose so secondary data may not be suitable to serve your intended purpose depending on the reason with which it was collected by the person who did the research so it may have been collected for a different purpose from that of the current user so meaning that uh, you would end up with making faulty results or making faulty decisions given that the reasons or the purposes of the research varied so in practice it is preferred to use the primary data whenever possible because of these following reasons so why would we prefer primary data when it comes to research so implying that primary data would be much more suitable to secondary data because of the following reasons one second resources may contain mistakes due to errors in the transcription made when the figures are being copied from their primary sources 
So there are higher chances that uh, uh, the secondary data could be having errors, which errors you could also be carried on by you to draw your conclusions when carrying out your research. Then two primary sources include definitions of terms and units used. So this makes the data more user friendly. So um, when you're collecting data from primary sources, you get to know, understand each and every term, each and every, every variable, each and everything that you meet in your data collected and define them. So meaning that if you define all the terms used and the units of measurement used in your primary data collected, then it will be very much user friendly to the people you intend to report to after the research. <clears throat> uh, characteristics of statistical units. Characteristics of statistical units. Uh, one, the statistical units. Units of measurement must be definite and specific. Then the units must be of such a nature that they can be correctly ascertained. Another characteristic is the units must be homogeneous and uniform. So they must be uniform. Uh, the units must be stable. So meaning that if you if you're measuring in terms of kgs then you must have kgs for all the units that you have to use or to find out so don't uh don't use the varying units on the same kind of statistics <coughs> Then the units must be appropriate for the purpose of the inquiry. The units must be appropriate for the purpose of the inquiry. So you have some methods of data collection. So you can go to methods of data collection. Uh, of course, we have several methods that we can engage or that we can employ when it comes to collecting of primary data as well as secondary. So the methods of collecting primary, the methods of collecting primary and secondary data differ. Because primary data are, orig are in original form from the source, whereas secondary data, the nature of the data collection is merely a work compilation. You compile from already existing data. <clears throat> so the collection of primary data. So what methods can we use when it comes to collecting of primary data? So there are various methods of collecting primary data. But of course the most important ones we have the observation method, interview method, a questionnaire method, and then through the schedules. <clears throat> so now we are going to look into details. We are going to look at one by one in details. One is the observation method. So we're going to find that uh, as, the, the, as you hear the word observation. So when you're using this method, for example, if you want to observe a certain characteristic, uh, you simply go where the population in which you want to collect the information from. Let's say you want to collect information concerning prostitutes. So, you, and, you, and you want to use the observation method. So sometimes you find that you have to go to that specific group and Simply, you may, you may be forced to act as one of them to be able to observe the traits you're interested in, and you pick up you pick up key areas or key characteristics of your interests as you observe their their activities. So under this method, the information is sought by way of investigators or enumerators 
and meritors own direct observation without asking questions to the respondent or a sampling units of interest so this method is particularly suitable in studies which deal with respondents who are not capable of giving verbal reports of their feelings for one reason or another and in other inquiries which do not involve verbal expressions like agricultural surveys <clears throat> So observations can take the following terms. We have structured observations versus unstructured observations. We have a participant observation and non-participant observation. Then we have a disguised observation. We can also have controlled and uncontrolled observation. So we can try to go through these forms of observation. Structured observations. So, uh, this is a form of observation where the observation is characterized by a careful definition of units to be observed. Uh, basically, the characteristics you're interested in are uh, the style of recording the observed information standardized conditions of observations and the selection of pertinent data for the observation so meaning that uh, you must go into the field when you've streamlined what you want to observe specifically from that particular group uh, how would you record whatever you have seen without uh, without the the respondents or the members of that particular group realizing that you're making some recordings or observations because they happen to notice that you're carrying out some research on them then they may change the characters they may change their ways from the normal ways of doing things and you'll end up with making wrong observations wrong research and then we have unstructured observation unstructured unstructured observation so this is uh, the observation that takes place without the above characteristics of a structured observation first so in advance so in this case uh, it is uh, just the opposite of structured whereby you do not consider the special the special the areas of interest what do you want to look for into the uh during the observation process uh the modes of recording so you realize that uh, under unstructured you do not consider those characteristics as you see in the structured observation then we have uh, <clears throat> another form of observation we have participant observation participant observation so when look when we talk about participant observation <clears throat> so this is when the observer observed by making himself or herself a member so meaning that uh, when it comes to uh, carrying out research on a particular group for example I've given an example of prostitutes I find that you may not be able to to observe whatever you want to find out without acting as a member given that uh, the activity sometimes uh, are carried out late at night uh, and their hostility as well may hinder you from getting the information apart from when you act as one of them then you'll be able to get whatever you want by acting as a member so this is when the observer observe 
it's by making him or herself more or less a member of the group he is observing so that he can experience what the members of the group experience and then we have non participant observation non participant observation so of course now this is the opposite so the observer or the researcher uh, touches himself he doesn't need to participate or to become a member of the group of interest so this is when the observer observes as a detached emissary without any attempt of his or her part to the, to experience through participation in what others feel so then you have disguised observation so uh, this is when the, ob the observer is observing in such a, a manner that his presence may be unknown to the people he is observing so someone makes his observation without the intended group or the group of interest interest knowledge so meaning that uh, if he is observing a particular group the that particular group shouldn't know of his interests or of his activities within that group so <clears throat> i find that as we said some groups may change their characteristics once they know that you're observing or you're interested in collecting some information from them then they may change they may divert away from their normal ways of doing things and then they turn contrary so your findings will not reflect the real them or the real features of those categories of people then you have a controlled observation a controlled observation uh, this is the observation that takes place according to a, a definite pre-arranged plan involving experimental procedures so it involves the use of mechanical instruments as aids to accuracy and standardized standardization uh, so you find that controlled observation is a planned observation well arranged in terms of the procedures to be used the measurements to be used the instruments to be used and experiments that will be conducted then now we have uncontrolled uh, observation so we can talk about the uncontrolled observation so this is an observation that takes place in a natural setting so in this case no attempt is made to use precision instruments so the major aim of this type of observation is to get a spontaneous picture of life and persons so no plans are put aside so you observe everything the way it is so and you take note of what you observe so advantages of the observation method we can look at a few advantages of this method and the others will read about them one <clears throat> it eliminates subjective bias for example if you carry out an observation in a group that uh, is not aware of your interests or of your activities then of course uh, activities things will flow characteristics will be portrayed as usual so meaning that you'll be able to observe whatever you're interested in observing so the level of bias is eliminated then uh, the information under this method relates to what is currently happening and therefore it is not complicated by either past behavior or future intention so you find that when you carry out research through observation you basically collect data that is reflecting the current status current characteristics current behaviors of a particular group of interest then uh, non-response errors are never encountered since it is 
independent of the respondents willing to respond so you find that uh, uh, some of the disadvantages faced in other methods like uh, questionnaires interviews i find that someone a respondent may not be willing or may will may not be able to respond to a particular question but in this case non-response errors are eliminated why because <clears throat> you 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 don't engage respondents to answer some questions you simply observe what takes place and then take records of that then you have some disadvantages of this method as well so it is time consuming that's one and expensive to conduct two uh, the information provided by the method is very limited <clears throat> so you find that you may not be able to collect much information depending on the time you give to the activity of observing as well as the size of the population or size of the sample used so you may be able to get limited information then uh, it may be interfered with unforeseen factors so this may give you still limited information or even no information then now uh, we can as well look at <coughs> the interview method the interview method so this is another method of uh, data collection uh, it is a method of data collection where the investigator or the enumerator is brought into contact with the respondent and asks him or her so this is where you have an interaction between the researcher and the respondent so it uh, it is where the researcher asks questions and the respondent is expected to give answers to such questions uh, the method can be used in two ways that is personal interviews or telephone interviews you can have a personal interview that is one-on-one -on -one interview and then you can as well have an interview conducted through a phone so can begin with the personal interviews <clears throat> so personal interviews so this is a method that requires a person who is known as an interviewer to ask questions generally in the face in, in the face to face contact in the face to face contact to the other person known as the interviewee so sometimes the interviewee may ask questions and the interviewer responds to them but usually it is the interviewer who initiates the interview and collects the information so personal interviews are of any of the following forms so personal interviews can take the following forms we have direct personal investigations we have indirect oral investigations uh, structured and unstructured interviews we have focused interviews clinical interviews and then non-directive interviews so we <coughs> shall go ahead to look into one by one the direct personal investigations so you find that uh, this is where the interviewer has to collect information personally from the concerned sources so uh, the interviewer has to meet uh, the interviewee and then they interact so he or she has to be on the spot and has to meet people from whom data have to be collected so this method particularly is suitable for intensive investigations so you have indirect oral investigations so this is where the interviewer has to cross-examine other persons who are supposed to have knowledge about the problem under investigation and the information obtained is recorded so under indirect oral investigations the researcher identifies persons with knowledge concerning the subject matter so you find that he goes or he attends to such people to collect the information he or she is interested in so most of the commission of inquiry appointed by the government make use of 
this method to carry out their investigations. Then we have uh, structured interviews. <coughs> so these are interviews which involve the use of a set of predetermined questions. So I find that uh, the interview is presented with a set of questions where he has to answer them. So uh, these predetermined questions are highly standard and highly standardized techniques of recording. <clears throat> so the interviewer follows a rigid procedure laid down asking questions in a form and order prescribed. So then we have unstructured questions. So we find that this form of interviews does not follow a system of predetermined questions. Uh, <clears throat> so unstructured interviews basically demand for greater skill on part of the interviewer. So the interviewer must have a greater interviewing skill and should be having deep knowledge. possessed with him. <clears throat> then we have focused interviews. Focused interviews. So these are interviews meant to focus attention on a given experience of the respondent in the field of inquiry. So you find that under this, under this form of interview, the interviewee has the freedom to decide on decide the manner and sequence in which questions would be asked and also the freedom to explore reasons and motives so you can move on you read about the other forms of interviews uh you can move on to the advantages of personal interview so what would be some of the advantages of using personal interview method? You can go through about and can go through a few of them. So what more information can be obtained and in greater depth. So you find that uh, uh, information can be readily obtained given that uh, the respondent is available to answer every question put before him or her. Uh, then two, the interviewer, inter the interviewer by his skill can overcome resistance. So he or she, the interviewer can use his skill to get response to each and every question asked to the respondent. Uh, so meaning that uh, the level of resistance is minimized or is overcome based on the skills of the interviewer then another one three <coughs> there is a greater flexibility under this method as the opportunity to restructure question is also there especially in case of unstructured interviews <coughs> <coughs> So we find that uh, there are cases where a question may not be well understood by the interviewee. So uh, in case of unstructured interviews, if the respondent does not understand the question or the intention of the question, then he may either give a wrong response or he may not even respond to the question. But uh, when it comes to a personal interview, uh, there is room to adjust or to restructure the question. So in case the interviewer asks a given question, the responder, in case the respondent fails to understand, he can ask for pardon or to rephrase the question in another simple way for him to understand, to break it down for simple understanding to give the response. So which is not uh, which is not a, a, character, a character when it comes to structured interviews. <coughs> 
another one is uh, personal information can as well be easily obtained under this method so there are, so you find that uh, the interviewee can get that courage that the information needed will be confidential and will be able to give the information as needed by the interviewee by the interviewer so then non-response is generally low so uh, it eliminates the elements of non-response when it comes to interviewing the respondent so if the chances of not answering are low unlike for structured kind of interviews where the person could decide to answer or not to answer but when you ask a question to an interview on a face-to-face -face arrangement uh, it's most likely to give an answer to you unlike the other non-personal interviews uh, <clears throat> those are some of the advantages read through the others as we proceed Uh, then we do have the limitations of personal interviews. So they've also got some challenges or some disadvantages. Uh, one of the disadvantage or the limitation of this personal interview is it is an expensive method, especially when a large and widely spread geographical sample is taken. So it may it tends to be very expensive when it comes to a large population to be interviewed, or in case the interviewees are ge geographically spaced. Let's say one is in Kampala, another one is in Jinja, so you find that a little bit of much cost will have to be incurred then another limitation it is subject to both interviewer and respondent bias so uh, bias is the extent to which an answer is altered in meaning by some action or attitude either on part of the interviewer or respondent so you find that uh, the, this form of interview can be subject to bias and the results of the interview may not reflect the primary intentions of the interview so another advantage is that certain types of respondents such as important officials or executives or people in high income groups may not be easily approachable and under this method and to that extent the data may prove inadequate so you find that some 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 interviews or some information may need to be obtained from the so-called high profile people and you know that such kind of people cannot be easily accessed or approached therefore you may not be able to approach the number of people you're interested in for purposes of gathering enough information so in so doing you'll find that you have inadequate information to make a reflective or to make an accurate conclusion so you read through the other limitations in the handout so in the interest of time you can proceed and look at other things i'll have uh, the basic requirements for carrying out a successful interview so what should the interviewer possess or what should the interviewer have for so as to have a successful form of interview so interviewing is an art governed by certain scientific principles so in order for someone to have a successful interview he must possess the following one interviewers should interviewers should be carefully selected trained and briefed so an interviewer should be friendly uh, he must have knowledge enough 
or interviewing skills that he can use to collect information from a given respondent. He must be trained and must be briefed on what specifically should be good or should be collected from the respondents. Uh, then interviewers should be honest, sincere and hardworking, uh, impartial and must possess technical competence and other necessary practical experiences. So sometimes you may find a difficult respondent so rude and so on. So meaning that you must become you must be able to absorb some non-usual exp expressions given by the respondent for purposes of having a successful interview then uh, occasional field checks should be made to ensure that interviewers <coughs> to ensure that interviewers are neither cheating nor deviating from the instructions given to them to do their job efficiently. So there must be field checks on these inter interviewers. So meaning that they must ensure that they keep on track for purposes of collecting some relevant information from the interviewees. So they must be able to do the job efficiently to avoid repeating the activity given the costs that are linked to this form of interview, this form of data collection. <clears throat> uh, then uh, we have some other key factors that uh, an, an interviewer should possess for a successful interview. So I request you to read through them when given that you have the handouts. So we'll go through them. So then we want to look at another form of interviews, that is a telephone interview. So when it comes to telephone interview, this is where an interviewer engages an interviewee via a phone. So this is a method of collecting data by contacting respondents on telephone. So it is not a very widely used method, but plays an important part in an in industrial surveys, particularly in developed regions. So you find that sometimes if uh, the respondents are geographically distanced, whereby the interviewer may not have costs to meet the interviewee physically, then a telephone interview would be suitable given that it, is, it will be less costly compared to the other physical or personal interview. So telephone interviews have got some advantages that let's look at a few of them. So one is faster than any other methods in obtaining the required data. So as when you compare it with a personal interview, uh, so the time someone would spend traveling to the respondent is saved when someone uses this when someone uses this telephone interview two it is cheaper than personal interviews since the cost per person is relatively low and no field staff is required so you know as a research company so you may not need to employ a research personnel to go to the field because you simply make a phone call from either office or your place of work. Then uh, recall is simple since callbacks are simple and economic. So in case you, some information was not very much clear, you can recall someone and then ask for what you, what you need to be elaborated on. Or sometimes even phone calls can be recorded so simply visit the conversation on phone and pick out the element you're interested in then uh, non-response characters or situation non-response situations are low or minimized so there are higher chances that responses will be good from each and every question um, uh, asked to the respondent the replies can be recorded without causing any embarrassment 
of the respondent so it is easy to record the conversation on phone using the very device or the very phone so to avoid recording or uh, disturbing the respondent <clears throat> then uh, at times access can be gained to respondents who otherwise cannot be contacted for one reason or the other so as uh, there are those people who may not be easily approachable as we saw with personal interviews so you find that if someone is not very much very easily approachable accessed or accessed then uh, a phone a phone call would work better provided is willing provided he or she is willing to pick up or to, to talk on phone then you find that phone a telephone interview will be very much suitable in such a case mm, then we have some limitations limitations of telephone interviews <clears throat> so little time is given to respondents for considered answers so this is because the interview period is not likely to exceed five minutes in most cases so you're going to find that the time on phone the time spent on phone is very small so you may not be in position to gather all the information in the little time of let's say five minutes so you have to gather less information due to the time factor then our uh, interviews are restricted to respondents who have telephone facilities only so there are limitations to this uh, if you to make a survey in a given big population not all of them will be in possession of phones so meaning that uh, uh, there will be restrictions on the numbers that you contact and some characters will be left out because what you may be looking for could be possessed by a person without a phone and then failure to access such a person you will not be able to get that information then uh, cost considerations <coughs> may restrict extensive geographical coverage so phone calls as well involve costs so meaning that in case you don't have much air time you may not be able to make enough phone calls so uh, this another one it is not suitable for intensive surveys it is not suitable for intensive surveys where comprehensive answers are required to various questions and another limitation is that uh, th it, mm, there is an existence of possibility of bias of the interviewer so there are higher chances for the interviewer to have bias when conducting a telephone interview hmm. and then uh, another method of data collection so we've so far looked at two we've looked at the interview method we also looked at the observation method and now we want to look at the questionnaire method as another data collection technique when it comes to primary data so questionnaires of course as you hear questionnaire so this method involves issue of questionnaires to intended groups of people for the of data collection uh, so this is a method of data collection where a questionnaire is sent to persons concerned with a request to answer the questions and return the questionnaire so the researcher prepares questionnaires in relation to specific information is interested in collecting from a particular group of persons and then uh, such questionnaires are sent to the respondents or the concerned category of people with an expectation that uh, they will have to answer those questions and then send back the answered questionnaires to the researcher for further analysis. 
So the question there consists of a number of questions printed or typed in a definite order on a form or set of forms. <clears throat> so once it has been prepared, it can be mailed to the respondents who are expected to read and understand and then write down their replies in the spaces provided in the questionnaire. So uh, these respondents of course have to answer on their own the different questions and it is a popular method of collecting data particularly used in the case in case of big inquiries like economic and business surveys so we we'll find that questionnaires are commonly used in businesses business surveys economic surveys and so on so we have some advantages possessed of possessed by this method so some of the advantages of the questionnaire method one it is relatively cheaper even when the population is large and widely spread uh, you find that uh, <coughs> the method requires less cost given for so that is for example you find that uh, a questionnaire may be simply sent to the, res to the intended respondent via mail and this person will have to answer the questionnaire and then send back via mail so you find that in such a case less costs are incurred then another <coughs> advantage it is free from interviewer bias since the answers are in the respondent's own words so you find that the information collected is most likely to be free from bias. Then uh, it also gives adequate time to respondents to think through their answers. Since the questionnaires are given to them for a specific period of time, they have enough time for them to think through before they give the answers. So meaning that uh, chances of getting the right information is high then uh, respondents who are not easily approachable respondents who are not easily approachable can also be reached conveniently using this method then another advantage is that it makes it possible to get correct information about sensitive, sensitive issues since people fill in fill the questions privately so <coughs> the privacy involved uh, Uh, gives room to get reliable answers and then large samples can be considered which makes the results more dependent and reliable so with questionnaires are uh, you able to call to to reach large numbers of people so meaning that you can make reliable conclusions since you can since the uh, various numbers of people respond to the same questions and then make thorough analysis to draw your final conclusions given the results of the findings uh, we have some disadvantages as well of this method <coughs> uh, <coughs> disadvantages of using questionnaire method so The questionnaire method has got some bias <coughs> due to non-response. <coughs> so if sorry about that. So bias due to non-response is often intermediate because of the low rate of return of valid field questionnaires. Uh, sometimes questionnaires may not give you the right answer. Someone would give wrong answers due to bias that the respondent possesses. So, uh, in case the respondent happens to be biased on, on the, of the subject matter, then I will not give you the right answers. <coughs> you may answer according to what it feels like answering. 
<clears throat> then it can the recursionary method can also be used only when respondents are educated and comparative. So of course there are situations where a respondent may not be willing to cooperate. So if he's not willing to cooperate, then he will not answer the questionnaire. He may either send back an a non-answered questionnaire or he may not even send back the questionnaire. Uh, two, uh, someone who is not ed educated may not be in position to fill a questionnaire so you find that they would be eliminated from the research. And then uh, three, <clears throat> the control over the questionnaire may be lost once it has been sent. So the researcher may have no control on the questionnaire once it has been sent to the respondent. So that this is where you're going to find the respondent answering according to how he has understood the question. Two, the respondent will take his time will take his time, meaning that the questionnaires may take long to be returned. They may delay in the hands of the respondent. Then three, there is inbuilt inflexibility because of the difficulty of amending the approach once questionnaires have been dispatched. So in case of uh, a wrongly stated question, let's say, for example, uh, in case a question has been asked in a questionnaire and dispatched, and then later on they find that maybe it is not reflective to the kind of information intended to be collected. So they may not be in position to recall to, to correct such a question after dispatching the questionnaire, meaning the information to be received will not be reflected to the intended purpose of the research. Another disadvantage is uh, a wrong respondent a wrong respondent may fill in the questionnaire thereby biasing the results so when someone wrong, uh, if a biased person fills in a questionnaire of course he will give a response that is contrary to what is expected of him or what is required of him by the questionnaire and this would give wrong results or wrong conclusions to the researcher uh, it is difficult to know whether willing respondents are truly representative, so you may not be able to tell uh, the right people to send to these questionnaires. So meaning this could be now giving you a misleading result. Uh, Basic considerations when designing questionnaires. When what do you need to put into consideration when it comes to designing of a questionnaire? So it should be noted, should be noted that the quality of data collected using the questionnaire method depends on the nature of the questionnaire used. So this therefore makes the preparation of the questionnaire and enumerators instruction manual very important aspects of data collection using this method <clears throat> so you, uh, you find that with this method the kind of data that you want to collect depends on the nature of the questionnaire you've used depends on the kind of questions set so meaning that uh, when you're preparing your questionnaires you must be very careful and try to incorporate what you basically want to achieve from the questionnaire, from the data collected. So the following factors need to be considered when designing a questionnaire. What do you need to look into? One, respondents should be assured that the information they provide will be treated in utmost privacy otherwise they might not be in position to give the correct information so some information are confidential <coughs> uh, so whereby respondents would not be willing to give them or to give them to the interviewer 
to the researcher. So meaning that you must assure them of the privacy, the confidentiality in the information provided to you. So because once confidentiality is not portrayed, then you will not get the right responses as intended by the question mayors. Uh, then questions asked should be in a logical order. For example, <coughs> uh, are you married? How old is your wife? And so on. So questions asked should be flowing. That's what we can say. They should be flowing kind of related then uh, the size of the questions should be should be kept minimum the size of the question should be kept minimum so what does that imply that when in your questionnaire you must have short short questions short kind of questions and simple to understand you shouldn't have those structured long questions because a respondent will not have time to read through and besides you may not even understand what you want him to give to you when it is that long structured question then uh, the questions should proceed in a logical sequence uh, moving from easy to more difficult questions and personal moving from easy to more difficult questions and personal or intimate questions should be avoided in the questionnaire then our technical terms and vague ex expressions capable of different interpretations should be avoided in a questionnaire so i uh, should try to use simple terms and direct terms that can be easily understood by the respondents don't use abbreviations try to use simple English that can be understood by the respondents then uh, questions affecting sentiments of the respondents should be avoided so emotional questions should be avoided when you want to get the right response <coughs> so questions that are kind of attacking should be avoided then uh, you must provide an adequate space of for answers to be provided so meaning the space must be enough for the respondent to write his response as per the question requirement uh, there are more other factors that can be considered for you to have an effective questionnaire so you read through the remaining factors <coughs> so uh, today today i would like to stop here so i would like to thank you for attending the lecture thank you for your data uh in case you have any questions please let's have time for some questions and interactions uh those with compliments those who have uh, something to say please raise up your hands and then unmute your microphones then you can interact and then uh, <clears throat> as you prepare your questions are those who those who could have missed the lecture due to unavoidable causes please find this lecture recorded and uploaded on my youtube channel so please subscribe to the channel and tap on that bell for notifications whenever new videos are uploaded such that in case you have missed a lecture you'll be able to re-access it via that youtube channel 
which is in the name so the name of the channel is okelo okay, alex official So please subscribe to this channel. It will be of, us, of an assistance to you, especially when it comes to missed classes or classes that were not clear due to network problems, or in cases where you, you never understood or where the, the, the speed was, was a little high because of of course we have different learning speeds uh, some people are fast learners others are slow learners so always you may never satisfy all these groups so in case you find that maybe the speed was high you have a chance to revisit the class the lecture and then take your time study at your own pace at your free time so i advise you to all subscribe to this channel and then learn with us at the same pace but at your same at your time uh <clears throat> there are those who would be wish willing to study ahead of us of course the channel has got videos for different uh, lectures with different classes so meaning that uh, you can access a different topic that we intend to look at ahead of us meaning by the time by the time you will reach that level it finds you already having some knowledge so it becomes easy for you to learn and perfect during now class given that you already have a slight background of the topic so uh with that allow me thank you for keep for tuning in allow me thank you for attending the lecture so we meet next time i'll be sending you the notes on our next topic to look at <clears throat> then uh, the handout we've looked at today is already in your possession try to read through the entire handout from the beginning to the end thank you so much see you next time bye bye